This is the story of November 300 Echo Romeo. Before we get started with today's video, I would really appreciate it if you could hit the like and subscribe button. I'm trying to get to 250,000 subscribers before the year is up, and I would really appreciate your help. On the 2nd of March 2023, a Challenger 300 flew into Windsor Locks Airport with a select group of people. The next day, it was time to take them all back to Leesburg Executive Airport. On the 3rd, the first officer was busy doing a walk around of the plane, looking to see if the plane was airworthy. As he made his way around the plane, he was interrupted by an airport employee who was tasked with topping off the plane's ice reservoirs. After all, what is a private jet flight without some rocks in your drinks, right? Now that the plane had its load of ice and the passengers happy, the plane started to taxi to the runway. Once on the runway, the pilots looked at everything and everything looked good. They pushed the engines to take off power and the speed began to climb. The jet pushed through 100 knots with no issue. And as the jet rolled down the runway picking up speed, the first officer noticed something weird about the plane. The primary flight display on the first officer's side was not behaving as he was expecting. The left side display showed that the plane was hollering down the runway at well above 100 knots, but the right side display barely showed any movement. They could not continue with this takeoff. They needed to call it quits. They hit the brakes, threw the jet into reverse, and taxied the plane off the runway to figure out what was wrong. This is when the first officer realized what had happened. Remember the guy who delivered the ice to the jet? Well, he interrupted the first officer at a very crucial time in the pre-flight check. And due to that, the first officer never removed the pitot tube cover from the pitot tube. If you're familiar at all with aviation, you've probably seen sleeves with bright red tags attached to them with the words, remove before flight, written on them. Well, as the tag suggests, these needed to be removed before flight. In this case, the pitot tube on the side of the first officer was blocked. So, one of the airspeed sensors was blocked, causing the airspeed not to show up on the first officer's side. But this was a quick fix. The first officer got out right then and there on the taxiway, took off the sleeve, and they were ready to fly. Or so they thought. As they started taxiing again, they got another warning. This time, the crew alerting system gave them a rudder limiter fault warning. The captain noticed that the flight director, you know, those little crossbars on the primary flight display that tell you how to fly the plane, was stuck in pitch mode. This wasn't the first time the pilots had seen this error, and usually conducting an avionic stall test cleared the errors right up. But not in this case, though. The first officer suggested that they call maintenance and let them advise on the best course of action. But in the end, they decided to fly with the error messages right there. So they lined up the jet for attempt number two. This time, they noticed that the V-speeds were not bugged on the primary flight display. You see, for takeoff, you have a couple of very important speed milestones. For instance, V1 is the speed at which you can no longer safely abort the takeoff. These important speeds show up on the primary flight display, but not this time. They were experienced in flying the Challenger 300, so they decided to take off anyway, calling the speeds out from memory. The plane picked up speed and they took off into the skies of Connecticut. It was smooth sailing at first, till they hit 400 feet in altitude. Now they had a new warning, mock trim fail, the warning said. The captain flew the plane on its course and then turned the autopilot on, which gave them a new error, autopilot stabilizer trim fail. But the jet kept climbing to its cruise altitude. During the climb, the pilot would disconnect the autopilot, adjust the trim, and then re-engage the autopilot. Each time the autopilot was disengaged and engaged, the autopilot warnings would clear out and then come back again. This happened a couple of times. After the third time, they got a brand new warning to add to the mix. This time, it read, Autopilot holding nose down. At this point, the first officer asked the captain if the autopilot was failing or if he was disengaging it, to which the captain replied that he was the one disengaging it. So, the first officer suggested that they shouldn't really use the autopilot for the climb. The captain agreed. But with the caution messages still there, they decided to troubleshoot the system. They thought that all of their problems started with the V-speeds not being in the system, so they thought that they could fix it by programming in the V-speeds back into the computer. After a while of trying that, they decided to go for a checklist. The first officer found the quick reference card titled Primary Stabilizer Trim Failure Checklist. This wasn't exactly what was happening to the plane, but it was the checklist that was closest to their situation. So they hoped that it would fix the underlying issues with the plane. 
The first step on that checklist was to flip the stabilizer trim switch to off. And the moment that the pilots did that, the autopilot disconnected and the plane rapidly pitched up to 11 degrees of pitch in just a second. The plane was now pulling upwards of 4 Gs. The captain, in a desperate attempt to right the plane, pushed the control column forward with about 90 pounds of force, bringing the plane to a near level. As the pressure on the control column was eased, the jet violently pitched up again, this time all the way up to 20 degrees. The jet was pulling so much Gs that the G switches in the flight data recorder were tripped, which killed power to the flight data recorder, meaning that we don't really know how bad the Gs really were. Now, if you're like me and you're wondering why the flight data recorder has a G switch, it's because the G switch kills power to the recorder anytime there are G levels experienced over five Gs. Meaning that in the event of a crash, the recorders stop working right then and there. Back on the Challenger 300, the pilots were able to wrestle the plane into a safe operating environment, but this ordeal was far from over. The pilots were informed that one of the passengers had been severely injured. She needed immediate help, and so they diverted. Just 17 minutes after the upset, they were on the ground and the passenger was whisked off to the nearest hospital. But unfortunately, she succumbed to her injuries later that day. So, how does a simple error on your computer screen turn into something that throws a plane around so badly that a passenger ends up losing her life? Well, it all started on the morning of the 3rd of March, 2023. Remember when the first officer was doing the walk around and he got interrupted by the ice delivery and he forgot about taking off the remove before flight tag? Well, as it turned out, that one small action would have unforeseen ripple effects that would lead to this incident. For this, we need to look at the HSTECU, or the Horizontal Stabilizer Trim Electronic Control Unit. The HSTECU is this computer that controls the horizontal stabilizer, but what we are interested in is the memory chip on this computer as it holds all the errors that were triggered by the plane. The data from the HSTECU showed that on the first takeoff attempt, Air Data Computer 1 and Air Data Computer 2 were both reading different values. I mean, it makes sense, one of the pitot tubes was covered. But if you have a difference of more than 5 knots for more than 20 seconds, you get an ADC1 slash ADC2 miscompare error, which basically means that they both don't line up. This error triggered two things. One you get the rudder limiter fault error on the crew alert system that the crew got before takeoff. Two, and more importantly, the HSTECU would turn off autopilot trim. For those of you that don't know, the trim is used to keep the plane in a steady state without any inputs being put on the controls. For instance, if you lose an engine, you're gonna have an asymmetric thrust situation. So you can trim the rudder to cancel out that yaw without having to put any force on the control column. You see, the autopilot can also trim the airplane, but on this aircraft, that very important system had been turned off. You still had a manual trim, albeit at a reduced rate of movement. So after they took off, when the autopilot threw up the autopilot holding nose down error, that was the computer telling the pilots, hey, the trim isn't working, the plane is out of trim, the plane wants to pitch up, and the autopilot is actively putting load on the flight controls to keep the nose of the plane down. Now, all of this is well and good. To test all of this, they decided to take a plane of the same make and model into the skies to see how it would behave. Sure enough, they got the mock trim fail, autopilot stabilizer trim fail, and the autopilot holding nose down errors. Interestingly, they did not get the primary stabilizer trim fail error though. Now, we are starting to understand what went wrong on this flight. The next mistake that was made by the pilots was that they carried out the primary stabilizer trim QRH checklist. This was not the checklist that they should have used. The first item on that checklist is to turn the stabilizer trim off. Doing that always disengages the autopilot. But on this flight, the autopilot was doing a very important task, a task that the pilots were not aware of. The autopilot was holding the nose of the plane down because the plane was out of trim because the auto trim system had been disabled. Once the autopilot was disengaged, nothing was holding the plane down anymore and the out of trim plane just nosed up. Choosing the wrong checklist kind of doomed this plane 
We don't know why they did that though, because the primary stabilizer trim error wasn't the first error that they got. The autopilot stabilizer trim fail and the autopilot holding nose down checklist made it very clear that you needed to be ready for sudden upsets. Here's a direct quote from the report. The checklist required the flight controls to be held firmly and provide a caution to minimize changes to airspeed and configuration to minimize the out of trim state, end quote. There were so many points at which this error could have been avoided. For instance, when they were on the ground and they got the errors, what they should have done is to power the airplane off and then turn it back on again. And this would have cleared all of the errors in the HSTECU. Moreover, the rudder limit message that they got was a no-go message, meaning that they should not have taken off with the error message still being present. This accident highlights the need to keep your seatbelt on at all times of flight. Even if you're seated, in this case, the seatbelt sight was turned on for the entire flight, so passengers had to use their discretion to walk around the cabin. So if you have one takeaway from this video, it should be that you need to keep your seatbelt on when you're on a plane at all times, even if it's uncomfortable, because you never know when you're going to hit some clear air turbulence or the pilots miss something or something just happens. It's unfortunate, but safety rules are written in blood. Thank you for watching this episode of Mini Air Crash Investigation. If you like the videos that I make, do consider liking and subscribing. It will really help the channel grow. I will catch you guys next time. Stay safe.